certainly are. Thank you very much. You. We can perhaps dim a bit of the lights. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Though my eyes are not exactly the best anymore. Thank you very much for the invitation. We'll, uh, we shall continue to talk about the royal seats and move to uh, another kind. Um, a sort of mysterious monument in uh, Norway, close to the cathedral of Trondheim, which mostly is known by the cathedral of Niederhus, and of course, the Niederhus is the medieval name of Trondheim. <clears throat> but in 1929, the name was changed of the cathedral back to the medieval Niederhus. So, people, many tourists ask, who is this Saint Niederhus, who is the, the cathedral is dedicated to? But it is only it is only two different names of the... Um, in, in, in Norway, the kings were first, and all through the Middle Ages, they were acclaimed, popular acclamation. From the 12th century, they were also crowned, but this was two different ceremonies which took place at different times and on different geographic locations for most of the Middle Ages. But we shall see how, in the later Middle Ages, these two um, traditions or, or um, ceremonies uh, sort of grew together to try to find a way of combining uh, them. Uh, for the acclamation, Trondheim or Nidaros has always been this, the site. And there was a special assembly. We had regional legal assemblies, uh, four of them, but we had one uh, thing or assembly which was, uh, took place here in Trondheim, you can see this, at the very point here, which was only for acclamation of kings. It had no legal, it was not a legal assembly, uh, it was only for acclamation of kings, and it took place where the river Nied uh, joins the Trondheim fjord, and the name Nida Us, Us means ma uh, the mouth of a river. Uh, so, uh, probably, this could have given place to the whole town, because it took place exactly where the river joins the fjord. This peninsula, which is created by the river, is called Nida Nes. Nes is a, like a peninsula um, uh, taken from a farm which was situated where the cathedral uh, now is. So I think that when the town got the name of Nida Us, it, is, it goes back to this assembly uh, which was um, down here. Uh, this is how it looked like about 1300 when it was more built up, and the tradition was moved up to another site. You can see here, this is a view from about 1720, but it, it shows the location of Trondheim on Nidaros very well, because in a region, it's a, it's a fjord basin, surrounded by hills and mountains, but it, it's quite unique in a way that it is a flat peninsula with a good harbor in the river, uh, which is very rare in this, uh, in this fjord basin. So it is a natural place for, uh, for uh, meeting up. Yeah, this is how it, the town was sort of in the Middle Ages, the cathedral down here, and this is where the assembly uh, met. Um, up here, this is north, there was, we know there was a big cross standing. We don't know if it was a stone, probably stone, could have been wood, a big cross, and here was also a great guild hall. A guild of, of uh, it was called the, the Great Guild, the Mikla Gildet, which was uh, established in the second half of the 11th century. An aristocratic guild where the upper class of the whole region met. The king was also a member. They had their own church dedicated to St. Margaret. Um, so this was clearly a, a place for, for ceremonial uh, meetings. Yeah, this is the town of the town in the 17th century. Now, uh, the coronations we know about, we can see the, the first one was in 1164. It was the first in Scandinavia. Oh, this is given up. This is, yeah. The first, is, the first in Scandinavia was in, in Norway, in Bergen, in 1164, and the last one before the Reformation took place in 1514. If you look at where the coronation took place, they definitely not in Trondheim, only at the very, towards the end of the Middle Ages, it was moved to Midaros, um, 1449 and then 
1450. So it is only a short period that Trondheim was the, the coronation uh, town. And I think this is uh, uh, interesting because, because this, this uh, coronation here marks the beginning of foreign dynasties. Um, especially the Christian I is the, the first of the Oldenburg dynasty from North Germany, became kings of Norway, Denmark, and Sweden. And it seems to me that they deliberately choose to be, to be crowned in Trondheim to give them a greater legitimacy. Because Trondheim and the cathedral is, of course, where the Saint Olaf, the sort of national saint of Norway, the eternal king of Norway, Rex Perpetuum Norvegia, his shrine was kept right up to the Reformation. Uh, <clears throat> about the taking of kings, we have the, this law, the Hild scroll from 1274. Hild is, the, is a combination of the court and the royal retinue, the royal guard. It's a name which, unfortunately, since the Second World War, is used very reluctantly because the Norwegian Nazis made the, used this uh, word. But the, for scientific purposes, we can still use it. You have this uh, chapter 5, it's the Kornungstekja, which literally means the taking of the king taking. Kornung is king, Tekja is taking. And Eina thing. It says, so Eina thing is the, the thing at the Öyr, or the, the, the mouth of the river. And it, and it proscribes how this ceremony is going to take place. It begins in the morning with mass and communion for the royal, I, I call him candidate, it is the word I in English the one who is the priest or designate, perhaps. Um, it says the true cross and other relics shall be carried in procession. We know there was a, a, a relic of the true cross in the cathedral, so I presume this, these were, were carried from the cathedral, which was at the opposite end of the town. And then all men, which means all, all uh, adult men in the town, shall go to the place of the thing, of the assembly, and there high seats shall be prepared. But the middle, or the, the seat in the middle, shall be highest and most richly decorated, and there no one shall sit. That sh it shall be empty at the beginning. And the chieftains, or the high nobles, shall sit on the seats on each side. This seems to be like a tiered um, seat. And the royal can candidate, or the king designate, is then placed on the lowest tier, directly uh, at the foot of the high seat. And when he has been uh, by a um, a man, um, um, uh, like a, one, one of, a man who is chosen to be the one who sort of calls him to be a king, uh, the name of king, uh, it says the bishops, the nobles, and the officers of the hill and the lawmen lift the king, that is that they probably escort him or lead him and place him in the high seat. And while doing this, the clerics in Tedeo, the common people seek a curia liaison, and after that, various groups, uh, according to rank, come up and swear their oaths of loyalty. So this is, this is probably going back to an older tradition, and it shows how it should continue to be done in the future. And it clearly says that this takes place at everything that means at this place uh, down here. So the procession would go from the cathedral and down here and back here. And we know from 1239 there was when one made himself king, the, the shrine of Saint Olaf was carried from the cathedral down, and he swore his oath on the shrine of the saint, which was clearly what you had to do in order to get the legitimacy <coughs> of being a real king. Now, there is something that turns up. There is in the great Icelandic Codex of the Flat Eyra book, which is written in the 1380s, but there is an insertion made about a century later, which takes, uh, which deals with the saga of King Harald, the Harbruder of Stamford Bridge fame. And um, about him, it tells that um, he built a, a church dedicated to, to Saint Mary, uh, close to the cathedral, and that was then. Uh, it was demolished already in the late 12th century um, and moved, but it says the altar of St. Mary's Church stood where St. New and Grand Christian, where now are the steps 
by the Christ Church. And Gradna is then thinking of Latin, and Gradus means step. It's a very rare word in Norse literature. It's used only five times. And twice it is concerning the acclamation of the king. One that we heard from Hildskrog, and one here in this saga. And the three other times it's used when describing a church where with steps leading from the nave up to the uh, choir, and on these steps the graduale is sing, the song, which takes, place, takes its name from gradus. So it, it's, it's a word which has been taken directly over from Latin into Norse. Uh, but this is, in fact, the only thing we have from the Middle Ages about this royal seat. But we have several post-Reformation um, uh, informations about uh, this. Uh, in, in 1567, the uh, Bergen uh, author, uh, Absol Lucas and Bayer, um, he has he been to Trondheim, he writes, on the cathedral churchyard is the place where the kings were crowned. He, he clearly believed it was the place for coronation, which must be wrong. But he had seen this place, so it was uh, there. Uh, almost contemporary, the minister appeared at close to priest, who had as a first-hand source a man who had uh, been educated at the cathedral, um, telling, among the other beautiful buildings in this town must be counted the beautiful chair or seat of the kings, which is built of masonry on the cathedral churchyard of extraordinarily beautifully carved stones with several stairs and levels or tiers, on which chair or seat the kings sat when they were acclaimed or crowned. Uh, a few years later, the, the Danish nobleman, the governor Ludwig Munch, he, he had the whole structure encased in a wooden house uh, on orders of the king, who then resided in Copenhagen. It was a timber, um, timber building, and this house was also used as the regional courthouse. It's a very interesting, it was very interesting to have known how this thing looked like, but uh, the, the, royal, the royal seat was encased in the, the courthouse for this, um, this uh, region. And it was until 1626 when it was moved, uh, the court was uh, moved. Um, and then, in 1661, <coughs> comes the Trondheim-born minister, um, Jacob Muscius, and he writes uh, a book, which is a, a poem of about a thousand lines, about the cathedral. And in this, uh, he, he spends some lines on the, uh, this seat, which is the best uh, description we have, sort of. But I have to, uh, to uh, agree with the... Uh, Gan Schoening, a century later, where he writes a bit exasperated about the, I wish this author had spent uh, more time doing some good descriptions rather than a heap of godly exclamations. Uh, but anyway, in his Latin, he, uh, which I have translated, he describes, it, of course in very poetic poems, a royal seat built of stone on a field close to the church. An assembly place also once stood here, highly respected. The royal seat shone with wonderful decorations of shining marble. You see so many stone circles that you could believe that you could believe they are fields decorated with narcissuses. And you could imagine that it was a hill rising up from the beach thrown up by the waves. But anyway, this is a this this gives us a kind of of um, uh, description, and I have an image uh, later on. But only the year after, that spelled the end of it, because the nearby St. Mary's Church was going to have a new tower, and they got permission to take 70 cartloads of stone from this monument, and it was carted off, uh, so that most of it was then uh, destroyed. So that when Gerhard Schoening in 17... Uh, 62, trying to make a description of the place. He could, what was left then, he wrote, I have examined this place closely, which is a rather circular place, directly north of the choir of the church, that is the cathedral, on the north, on the south side of the road. So one must conclude that the said royal seat 
has also been built as a circle with stairs leading up on all four sides and all around it decorated with pillars and with flowers and sculptures. That is a very richly decorated masonry um, sculpture. So, let's see. Moschius, he illustrated his, uh, his book with um, two engravings showing how the cathedral looked at his, uh, his time. It was, the nave was in ruins, as we see. There is the octagon to the left. And if you see to the bottom left, see how this comes up. There is, this is a very, not a very good reproduction, but there is a group of five persons standing in, uh, surrounded by stones. And this is probably a description of what was remaining of this, uh, this, uh, 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 so, and if you look very carefully, these five persons are the different social groups. There is a king in the center, there is a cleric, there is a nobleman, there is a farmer, and there is a, a, a merchant or, or fisher. Uh, so it's a, probably a, like a symbolic representation of uh, the society looking at these remains of the, uh, of the uh, past. Uh, if you see what we know about the archaeology, archaeology of this, this is a view of from about 1800, uh, rather naive, but you see the churchyard, which is a very rich variation of monument. Here is the medieval uh, masonry wall surrounding the cathedral, which was then later taken away. And here is this, there is a kind of mound or hill where this structure has stood, but it is partly used for burials. Uh, this time. A view from the other side, you can see here, somewhere, uh, so the graves are being, beginning to fill up this um, area. Uh, but then the first um, antiquarians started to take some interest in, in this, and the first one is the officer, uh, Lumen Dieter Strieber, in 1817, who made a map of all the graves, and he was still able to identify in this area it says, Rudea den Gamme Kongestur, ruins of the old royal seat. So it was clearly still visible in this area, something of, uh, of this, uh, this uh, construction. And, but the only excavation we had was done in 1887 by the inspector of the restoration of the cathedral, Otto Kerstin. And unfortunately, there was not very much left at this time, but we found two different structures. The lower one was an, an, an angled um, construction uh, with, a, seems to be like a well in one corner and a foundation here, and uh, more directly below the, the surface, uh, a rounded uh, structure which seems to have had a, a buttress of some kind. These are only repeat sketches. Yeah. Here we can see a bit more of it. It was clearly not well, well preserved. Here is the chapter house of the cathedral and this pathway of road leading through the place. This is more uh, a sketch and we see that because of many recent graves they could not dig so very many places. But this is how the upper part of the, um, the construction uh, looked like. But to Krefting, this was more than enough for him to say categorically that this was the, the royal uh, tribune and the structure below it was the choir of St. Mary's Church. And so he believed literally in this source from the late 15th century saying that the church was built above the choir of St. Mary's Church. Now why it should have been that is hard to say today. So when he published this uh, find, he, uh, um, he uh, proposed that the, the, the ground plan of, uh, of a church, and he even made a reconstruction of it. And here is this, uh, um, which I think is a well, uh, in, the, in one corner. And this was then immediately accepted by, by everybody and has been a uh, persistent visitor in all later literature on the cathedral and its uh, history. Uh, as late as uh, the 1977 
PhD thesis of Evin Munda. You see here how he has conjectured this church building, perhaps a lot even larger building where the the this rounded structure structure would fit in, uh, clearly modeled on the on the chapter house of uh, the cathedral which we see uh, here. Uh, so there, there, are, there are several masonry structures, but it's very hard to get anything uh, proper out of what it uh, is. And this is how it looks, the site looks today. So the, what is left is probably here, uh, somewhere. Um, yeah. The only clue to my, for me to, to the dating of this is Muscius's information that it was richly decorated with Narcissus and, and marble. And there's only one building period of the cathedral where uh, the use of uh, Narcissus or lilies uh, is very predominant, and that is when the octagon was uh, restored after the great fire of 1328. So, uh, uh, a good suggestion would be that it was built in the same period, uh, let's say about 1330 to 1350. And we know that in 1335, um, the, the young king Magnus Eriksson, who was the joint king of Denmark, of uh, Sweden and Norway, was um, acclaimed in Trondheim. So it could have been a structure uh, constructed uh, for this occasion, meaning that the site of the acclamation was then moved from the north end of the town by the fjord and next to the cathedral, so that, uh, so that it now took place inside the ecclesiastical area. But he was not crowned in Trondheim, he was crowned in Stockholm, uh, in a joint coronation for Norway and Sweden. Uh, but he was acclaimed in Norway when he reached age of maturity, that is when he took over uh, formerly the reigns of, uh, of power. Uh, but uh, I think this, this, is, this is a good clue to the dating of this, uh, uh, this uh, royal seat, because later, after the Black Death, the quality of the stonework of the cathedral went very much down, and there was very little new carvings, it was mainly reuse of older things. So this was the last period when there was a fresh artistic um, contribution to the building uh, history. So if there was use of a marble or richly rich carved stones, the late uh, or the sec second uh, quarter of the 14th century would be the uh, most uh, period. And it must have been a very interesting structure. Uh, the one that Kerti found had a diameter of about 10 meters, the upper curving parts. Uh, and if, if, if it was possible to build a wooden house around it, that would have been a, approximately the maximum of what you could uh, could uh, technically mani manage if it was a, a block built, a log house, which was the most common way of building in, uh, in Trondheim. Now we have seen these already, but the, the, the nearest and only parallel I've been able to find is, the, of course, the Timbal Hill on Isle of Man which can give a, a kind of impression of, uh, of how this uh, um, tribune or seat in Trondheim could have looked at, only that this is an earthen construction and Trondheim was clearly a masonry construction which had a much uh, better finish. Yeah, uh, I found this on the internet, I found this uh, drawing of a king placed on a, mo a mobile throne on top of Timwald Hill and the, the cathedral, uh, or the church, then opposite it. Uh, to finish off, there is a very interesting which, uh, source from Iceland which nobody have used, but I think it's, it's quite interesting to, to see this in, in a more cosmic view. Now, if this tribune, if this king seat was circular, or it could have been octagonal, the, the octagon of the cathedral is where the, the body of St. Olaf was buried, the, the most important shrine in the, in the, uh, in the country. And this, this octagonal shape has clearly been very important. And from this, it's, it's, it's a talk, which is a, a short story, really. And it's about a man called Laud, 
of head. Uh, and, and it tells about, uh, this is from a, a, a manuscript called Morkinshina, which was written about 1220. And it tells that how Olaf, or Saint Olaf, the later Saint Olaf, visited this man Red, uh, who lived in a splendid farm, and, uh, and for, uh, e in the evening the king was led to his sleeping quarters. Uh, um, and you can see uh, he was led to his sleeping quarters, which is splendidly prepared. He looked about while he was in the outer corridor, examined the form of the building, which he saw at once to be constructed on a circular plan. Going further in, he found cannoning all the way around the inner side of the corridor. There were four main doors to the building, equidistantly <coughs> placed. Twenty high stout posts had been erected inside the building. They stood in a circle, upholding the watered roof, which was all decorated with the signs of color. The spaces between the posts were screened, and within were set with beds for the nobility. That is, the, the people of little lower rank, they were sleeping on a lower tier. In the center was a broad circular platform of wood with steps to mount it running round. On the platform stood a large bed, fashioned with unsurpassed skill. Most of the woodwork was finished with a turner's chisel. It was painted all, all over and plated with gold here and there. The corner post was surmounted as huge knobs of gilded brass. Running out from the corner post were iron bars bearing candlesticks, and upon them were fixed three branch processional candles. This sounds very much like a description of the, of the octagon the cathedral octagon, with the shrine of St. Olaf. We know that the shrine had an, a, an outer cover which could be lifted up, uh, probably uh, via iron bars in the corners. So this sounds like, an, uh, like a poetic version of, uh, or combination of the king's uh, bed, uh, bed place uh, combined with the... Um, with the um, uh, with the, with, with the shrine of the saint, but it also gives quite a resemblance, I think, to, to the idea of this place where the king was placed for his acclamation. Uh, so it is possible that, uh, that this is how the idea was of where a king should, uh, should rest. And the more, um, in, the lower, in the last section, the more cosmic, the king gazed at the ceiling, then we saw depicted God himself in his orb of light. Higher and beyond were shown the angelic hosts, lower down the firmament which closes in its circuit all the regions of air. There were also depicted the heavenly bodies, and so on, and uh, so on. And if we go back to the, to the octagon here, to the shot, we see here how, how uh, it has an ambulatory, it has a raised central group, and in the middle of, uh, directly in the central room stands the high altar where the, the shrine of the saint was placed uh, before the Reformation. So it, this description is in a way a description of how the octagon uh, probably uh, looked like. Time is used? I <coughs> hardly just mean it. Just, yeah. Uh, just to show, uh, because <laughs> we are also doing a scientific thing, in January this year, we had the first GPR uh, scan ever uh, inside uh, the cathedral. Now most of it has been dug out in the 19th century. It's only the octagon, which you see here, which has not been completely excavated. Here is the, the main altar and the site of the pursued shrine. Um, we know from the 19th century there was, they found some foundations from the older Christ church of the late 11th century. Uh, so we, we hoped that we could find uh, some traces of, uh, of these walls, and we did. Now, this is with disregard, because this is the, the, the hot water line going uh, for the heating. But this, this uh, according to the one who did this uh, investigation, he said these are very good and clear signals. And these, they do not show uh, the, the square chancel which we have been expecting to find. It looks like a circular or polygonal, most probably octagonal structure, which then must predate the present octagon, which was the building of which began in, in the 1170s, 1180s. That means we, can, we have perhaps an, a structure going back to the late 11th century, if, it's, if it's, this is the real thing. We have to do a new investigation. Uh, we were really looking for the grave of St. Olaf, 
because we know he was buried in secret somewhere under the floor after the Reformation, and nobody knows where. Uh, I think he's there, and there is a very interesting signal there. So I, I itch to get money to commission <laughs> to be able to go, go uh, down there. Uh, we, we did try a GPR where this royal seat is presumed to have placed, but there were too many disturbances, um, so we didn't get any cut-off results uh, out of it. Yeah. Thank you very much.